we're living in some very, very extremely serious times. Serious, as they used to say back in the day, serious as a heart attack. This is not a game. This is not a joke. I believe that things are so serious in the world today that ministers, pastors, evangelists, when standing in this pulpit, shouldn't even crack a smile. That's how serious things are. Shouldn't the minister reflect the seriousness and the urgency of the time we're all living in? This is very, very serious. So we're going to study today the science of communion with God. And I'm going to start off with an introduction before we pray. Give me one second, please. We all know what's going on in the Middle East, correct? This headline on CNN.com says, Conditions in Gaza are a complete what? Catastrophe as residents try to flee. That word catastrophe is a very strong word. You remember that little submersible submarine that went down a few months back and it had that unfortunate accident? They literally called that, they called it a catastrophic implosion. So by definition, the word catastrophic means that's it. There is nothing else that can get worse, right? So this condition now in the Middle East, this is a particular shot of Gaza City, is at basically as bad as it can get. But we all know things worldwide are going to get worse. Israeli woman screams, don't kill me, as she gets kidnapped by Hamas terrorists. Now here she is now on a motorcycle being taken to... <laughs> Taken to her death. Hamas hostage crisis to limit Israel's military action. So all these people, this young lady here, these individuals here in the middle, and this brother right here, they know what's at stake here. They know what's been going on, the tensions in that region for several, several years. They know being led away captive doesn't mean they're going to be fed a nice three-course meal and be sent back home. They know that they are going to die. We're talking about catastrophe. Israeli woman whose grandmother was kidnapped by Hamas, quote, they had no mercy for anyone. Now somebody says, well, Brother Bridges, that could never happen here. That, that's over there. We're not concerned about that because that's way over there across the water. Hmm. The present is a time of what? Overwhelming interest to how many living? All living. This is the book Education, page 179, paragraph 5. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, what kind of men and women? Thinking men and women of how many classes? All classes have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us. They are watching the strained restless relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of every earthly element. Is that true? And they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. Even the common atheist can feel and recognize the fact that something is going on in this world today. Something is amiss. Something is about to happen. We are on the brink of something real, real serious. And this should sober us all up in terms of our spiritual lives. There's a thinking man. That's Mr. Glenn Beck. We all know who he is, right? He was on CNN for many years. In 2000, I believe it was 2008, he left CNN and went to Fox News. Then in 2011, he went and started his own his own syndicated program. Very successful. Definitely a thinking man, always prognosticating and trying to plan based on trends and events and you know current things taking place in the world in the political, scientific, and religious world, etc. He has a very good track record. He almost never misses because he's a thinking man. I want you to read with me something he had to say on the Tucker Carlson show. Tucker Carlson was recently fired by 
Fox News. Glenn Beck wrote a book called The Great Reset. Listen to what he said on May 31st of this year. Pay attention, please. Brazil and China are going to trade in their own currency. That's the beginning of the end of our currency, meaning the U.S. That means a dollar collapse. That means we become Venezuela. We all know what's going on in Venezuela, right? By the way, Venezuela is a communist nation. We all know that, right? It's so bad there, people are breaking in the zoos to eat the food of the animals. That's how bad it is there. You don't think that can happen here? You don't think that's going to happen here? Inspiration says otherwise. Listen, we will have war with China. We will have war with Russia and Iran. By the way, Iran or Iran are already taking steps to get involved with this Middle East conflict. It is not going to stay the way it is. It's going to escalate because the Bible says so, right? Didn't Jesus say that in Matthew 24? Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be what? Famines and pestilences and earthquakes in how many places? Diverse or various places. Then he says in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. I love that word sorrows. I love that word. Jesus is the great, he's the, he was the great linguistic tactician. Never wasted a word and used the perfect word at the perfect time. What he told us or taught us by using that word sorrows, that sorrows in the original Greek literally translate to mean birth pangs. So just as a woman who was with child at some point in time during her term starts to experience contractions, they grow closer and closer together as she approaches the birth date of the baby and they also grow more and more intense. That's exactly what's happening in our world today. Exactly. The contractions have begun. Mr. Beck then goes on. By 2025, what year? Mm. That's not too far away, is it? We are going to be at what? War. We, the United States of America, are going to have a new dollar. A currency that probably is coming from the central bank. We'll have a currency collapse and we will live in a virtual police state. Are you ready for that? I'm not ready for that. I know that might sound crazy to a lot of people. It's not far off. Is that a serious statement? Did you know that Mr. Beck was a, was a preacher? You didn't know that, did you? Well, he starts to preach right here. He says, please turn to God. Repent, pray for our country, pray for peace, put on the full armor of God. Of course, he's, he's, he's quoting Ephesians chapter 6, right? So obviously, Mr. Beck is a Christian, and he's not ashamed of his Christianity and his faith, is he? He's preaching basically to the whole world because Fox News is a global entity. So he's given the, the planet a sermon on what we need to be doing to prepare. Question is, are we as Adventists, are we as God's modern, antitypical, spiritual Israel getting ready? The world believes that Israel, which came to be in 1948, the world believes that Israel are God's chosen people, the identifiable Jews of today, the geographical Jews of today, but brother, brother, sister, the Bible tells me, and the spirit of prophecy tells me, that we are modern spiritual Israel. Amen. We are going to go out and give the truth to this entire planet at some point. We are God's chosen. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now, Brother Beck, and I can call him Brother Beck because he's a Christian, correct? Brother Beck uh, told us and mentioned the year 2025. He said, we will be at war. Currency collapse, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A crucial system of ocean currents is heading for a collapse that would affect every person on the planet. We're talking about thinking men and women. A vital system of ocean currents could collapse within a few decades if the world continues to pump out planet heating pollution, scientists are warning, thinking men. An event that would be catastrophic, there's that word again, for global weather and affect every person on the planet all of you and me. 
A new study published Tuesday in the journal Nature found that the Atlantic Meridonia or Diagonal overturning current, of which the Gulf Stream is a part, could collapse around the middle of the century or even as early as what year? 2025. Now I'm not prognosticating, I'm not, I'm not prophesying, but we're talking about the thinking men. Inspiration says thinking men are thinking. Will the Gulf Stream really collapse by 2025? There's that year again. 2025, let me read that, that heading. The Gulf Stream system of warm ocean currents could collapse as early as 2025, a scientific study has warned. Another one, LinkedIn, why the global economy will collapse by 2025. You remember this? January 6, 2021. They rampaged the Capitol in D.C. Do you think that it ended there? Now, a lot of people are being handed jail sentences. I saw, and some of you probably saw this the other day, there was a woman that was involved with this, and she was given for over four years in prison. They handed down a sentence of, to her for four years. But it didn't end here. How do I know that? Project 2025. Anybody familiar with this? All right. I can't give you an entire dissertation on this today. But in a nutshell, what they're going to do is take what happened in, on January 6, 2021, but they're going to change the strategy. See, this was, a, this was, an, this was an, an aggressive move here. It was aggression. What they're going to do now in 2025 with Project 2025, they're going to change their strategy to subtlety. What do I mean by that? They have 50,000 people across the board, evangelicals, politicians, government leaders, scientists, all these different groups and, and segments of society, they're putting them all together and what their plan is to, is to do this. January 20th, that year, 2025, when whoever is, is inaugurated as president of the United States, and of course they're hoping that it is a, a Republican, they're on top of that hoping that it's Donald Trump. On that day, that's going to launch a 100-day plan. They got 50,000 people in place. That's their plan to implement this process to replace every, every single person that has any type of important position in the government, House, Senate, whatever it may be, so they can fulfill their agenda to, to how should I put this, evangelize basically our nation, but not the way people think they're going to do it. Remember now, Donald Trump had these elite visions of being a dictator, and that's what they're going to do in 2025. Whoever is in office, they're going to implement a dictatorship through this project. This is real, real serious. So we're seeing the United States of America, literally before our eyes, start to turn from a Republican and Democratic society to begin to speak like a dragon. That's what's happening. So this is very, very, very important and very serious. So again, it's going to be subtle. They're already talking, and I'm not, you can just look on Google and YouTube yourselves. They're already talking about enforcing and passing a law, forcing people to go to church on Sunday. They're already talking about that. Did I say in the opening that we're living in very serious times? Very, 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 very serious times. This is not a game. A time is coming when the law of God in a special sense, when the law of God is in a special sense to be made void in our land. Is that possible? Project 2025. The rulers of our nation will, by legislative enactments, enforce the Sunday law, and thus God's people will be brought into how much peril? When our nation, in its legislative councils, shall enact laws to bind the consciences of men in regard to their religious privileges, enforcing Sunday observance, and bringing oppressive power to bear against those who keep the seventh day Sabbath, the law of God will, to all intents and purposes, be made void in our land, and national apostasy 
will be fo followed by what? National ruin. Now that word ruin is an interesting choice of words. It means destruction, total, complete annihilation and destruction, ruin. So the USA, the great old USA is going to come to her end. So that, that tells me, I'm not a rocket scientist, I don't have a PhD, nothing wrong with a PhD, but that tells me that there's going to be a war, just like Lynn Beck said, and we're going to lose. But we're not talking about conventional wars, are we? We're at church today, aren't we? So what kind of war are we talking about? Paul writes, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but what? Mighty, through God to the pulling down of what? Stronghold, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. So our war is a spiritual war, and the war is real. The war is very, 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 very real. So are you ready for this? You know what that is? Sister Mimi knows what that is. I was in Ethiopia a couple of years ago for 30 days, and this was my toilet. This was my toilet. Now, I'm not saying the whole nation has toilets like this. Ethiopia has major cities, too. But we did a mission effort in a village town six hours from the capital of Addis Ababa, way up in the mountains, way, way up. And they took us on a little tour of our little compound. This brother that was well-to-do, had a nice little place, had a store attached to it, had a couple of bungalows. And he, he set us up. It was a team of five of us. He set us up in his place for the month. And so they took us around, showed us our rooms, and they, had, they bought this cook, this chef from Addis Ababa, a young lady, 23 years old. And they said, let us take you, in, we have to show you your bathroom. Okay. So they took us out of the compound, outside. We walked around, past the cows, past the pasture, past the hay bales, and they showed us this. This is your bathroom. So we're looking like, well, what is it? It's a composting toilet. Well, what is that? Well, you, you squat down, you do your business. So we all kind of looked at each other, but after one day, you're a professional. <laughs> you adapt very quickly. I'm showing you this for a reason. It's going to come to this. All U.S. infrastructure is going to be gone, obliterated and destroyed, all of it. So this was our, our toilet for a month, men and women. This was the toilet for the church that we had a campaign at, our meetings at, an evangelistic campaign, Daniel Revelation series for that month. This was the church's toilet. Now this is, they made this especially for us, they, they, they considered us to be like these great dignitaries coming from America, right? Not knowing that we're less than nothing. But the church's toilet was even worse. It was much worse. So brother, sister, my point is, we have some serious times that are coming. Very, very serious times that are coming. They're right on the horizon. So we are in a war. Revelation 12 tells us that. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, and they prevailed not. Neither was their place found in heaven anymore. And the dragon was cast out to the earth. So it all started with a war up in heaven, didn't it? Then that war transitioned from here to earth. We're told that in Ephesians 6. For he wrestled not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness, wickedness in what kind of places? High places, Ephesians 6, 12. So high, that word is, again, another very interesting word that Paul uses, high. The original translation in the Greek literally means heaven sent or originating in heaven. It's the perfect word. That's where the war started, in heaven, in high places. So it was a real war. Jesus says in Luke 10, 18, we all know the verse, he says, I saw Satan fall as what? Lightning out of heaven. Isn't lightning by nature a very violent event or occurrence in nature? So he was cast down not gently, not in waddling, swaddling clothes. He was struck down to the earth. Struck. So we are in a war. It's a real war today. Luke 22, 3, the Bible says, Then Satan entered Judas, 
surname Iscariot, being numbered with the twelve. Does that sound like a war? Is Satan, if he entered Judas then, can he enter one of you or one of me or me today? Yes, he can. Our only defense is what? Is this right here. This is it. So we are in a war, a very serious war. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 3, and then we're going to pray. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Let's talk about a component of this war before we pray. Genesis 3. In case you're joining us late or walked in late, the title of our message this morning is The Science of Communion with God. The Science of Communion with God. Genesis 3, we're going to start at verse 1. Are we all there? Amen? Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, please bless your words as we read them. These are words of life and truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verse 1 of Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, the serpent, of course, being the devil, <clears throat> working through this animal, this beast. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Two. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Three. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye do what? Verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, casting doubt in Mother Eve's mind, right? Coming with a counterfeit gospel. 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as what? Gods, knowing good and evil. Hmm. Six, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. Now, we're told in inspiration that Lucifer is very, very smart. Is he smarter than you? Is he smarter than me? So he was in that garden now. <clears throat> he recognized there were millions and millions and millions of trees. But there was one tree God said, don't touch that one. You have plenty to eat. This was a lesson in temperance, brothers and sisters. Temperance. You have all you need, just don't touch this one. This is an intemperate tree. So Satan, I'm sure, deduced, wait a minute now, they have all this food which is sustaining them. He knows they were made a little lower than the angels, but they, they have to eat. So they need nourishment to maintain the physical body. So Satan concluded, wait a minute now, if food sustains their body and the food they're eating purifies the blood through the body, it has to also include what? The brain. So he realized once he got Adam and Eve to sin, to fall, not only do I have them physically, brothers and sisters, I have their minds. Now I have their minds. So I, I really can get them now. Question is, is that important? Well, let's see. Councils to the Church, page 101. The brain nerves which commune, communicate with the entire system are the only... What word is that? The only medium through which heaven can commune, communicate to man and affect his inmost life. Our study is the, the science of communion with God. Whatever disturbs the circulation of the electric currents in the nervous system lessens the strength of the vital powers, and the result is a deadening of the sensibilities of the what? Again. Sister White calls Satan a wise general. He knows what he's doing. I frequently sit down to the tables of the brethren and sisters, Sister White says, and see that they use a great amount of milk and what? Sugar. These do what? Clog the system, irritate the digestive organs, and affect the what? The brain. Anything. How much? 
anything that hinders the active motion of the living machinery affects the brain very directly. Now I'm preaching to myself. My wife will tell you years ago, I was a hostess chocolate cupcake addict. Addict. It was a, it was a drug addiction. I would walk in the store and I, I'd just seen the wrapper on the shelf. It was like I got the shakes. <laughs> And then I would time it. Once a quarter, they'd come out with the three-pack. This is in Los Angeles. The three-pack would come out. You know, I was out of my mind then. I was so bad, I would buy these, and I would buy cake icing and spread cake icing on top of the cupcakes to add more sweetness to it. I would bring them home, and I would hide them from my wife. I would put them in my shoes up on the top of my shelf of my, of my, uh, my closet, because my wife was a shorty. I knew she couldn't see that high. So this, this was speaking to me. Praise God for overcoming. Amen? Amen. But this is very serious. Milk and sugar combined, milk and sugar combined affect the system just like alcohol. It's like you're an alcoholic. And I experienced that. I was addicted to chocolate cupcakes. Hostess. Praise God for deliverance. Amen? What does commune mean? Commune. Share one's intimate thoughts or feelings with someone, especially on a what kind of level? Spiritual level. Hmm. The purpose of praying is to commune with God. Looks like Google ag agrees with the Bible. What do you say? Feel in close spiritual contact with. He spent an hour communing with nature on the bank of a stream. I like that. Do you like that? That's biblical. But Satan has a counterfeit. <clears throat> Satan communes too, but not for the same reason that, that God does. We're going to pause here and we're going to pray and ask for God's help for the rest of the study. Amen. All those that are able, please kneel with me and join me. Heavenly Father, we're thankful and grateful again <clears throat> that you have blessed us to be here today. We need you in our midst, Lord. Please help us to focus and concentrate, to not be distracted, to not have our minds to drift. Lord, you have so much to say to us, all of us, including me at the top of the list. Please speak to us, preach to us this morning, that we may leave here more edified than we were when we walked in, that we be more educated on your, your great grand principles and truths of salvation than we were before we walked in. Please, Lord, we need an experience today. Please bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, for every lawful, God-given privilege, Satan has a counterfeit to suggest. That's my character and personality, book one, page 220, paragraph three. Let's see some of these counterfeits. Counterfeit communion. Mm, that's a big one. We're going to see that in the Bible. Health reform. Family. Is that true today, counterfeit family? It's not a condemnation, it's a fact. Counterfeit church, education, recreation, or what Sister White calls recreation, Bible versions, worship, gospel, counterfeit Sabbath, counterfeit system of living, counterfeit lie, loud cry. You know, Satan, when he comes personating Jesus Christ, you know he's going to have a counterfeit loud cry. You know that, right? He's going to go throughout all the world with his subjects and preach that Sunday is the Sabbath. It's been changed by him. Counterfeit loud cry and counterfeit, of course, second coming. Coming. I'm going to ask you all to please meet me in the book of Luke, in the New Testament. The book of Luke. And we're going to read from Luke chapter 22. Luke 22. Luke chapter 22, the science of communion with God. I pray that God helps us all to understand how important communion is with him today. It's salvational. It's, it's absolutely salvational. Luke 22, starting at verse 1. We all there, amen? amen? Again, the Bible says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the what? Two. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him. Kill who? Jesus. 
for they fear the people, the common people who believed. Three, then enter Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, I just quoted this, being of the number of the how many? Twelve. Verse four. And he went his way and did what? Communed with the chief priests and captains, how he might betray him unto them. Is this communion for a good purpose? No, it isn't. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. Remember, Brother Judas had an idol, didn't he? A serious, serious idol called money and increase. Six, and he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. That's a big clue right there. So he has a commun communion, his own devilish communion. It's not to glorify God, but to glorify himself. And he makes sure that it's also done in secret. So he takes aspects of the heavenly communion and implements it into his devilish communion. That's what Satan does. So it will appear, appear sanctified and holy on the surface, but subsurface is very evil. Amen? Let's get another example. Let's go to 1 Samuel, Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18. Now, just to set this up, the chapter, the previous chapter, we all know what happened. David slew Goliath. And Saul wasn't very pleased about that, was he? No. It really got bad when the women and the maiden, maidens were having a little street parade and they were singing and shouting. And the sisters started talking about Saul killed thousands, right? How many did they say David slew? Ten thousands. Ten thousands. So Saul, the Bible says, was very wroth with David. And the Bible also says that he eyed David from that point forward. He eyed him with an evil eye. He was out to kill him. No matter what he could do, anything he could do to disrupt David's life, disrupt David's life, excuse me, and also to destroy him. That's what he set out to do from that point. Let's pick it up at verse 14. 1 Samuel 18, 14. And David behaved himself wisely in how many of his ways? All his ways. And because he did that, the Bible says, and the Lord was what? With him. God with us. God with us. 15. Wherefore Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. Isn't that interesting? It seems that people become a little intimidated when they see that you are very serious about your walk with the Lord, aren't they? Don't they? That happens. I've seen that happen. 16. But all Israel and Judah did what? Love David. Why? Because he went out and came in before them. He put them first. He looked out for his people first. He was a true leader. 17, and Saul said to David, here it comes, Behold, my elder daughter Merab, her will I give thee to wife. Only be thou valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said, Let not mine hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. Hmm. So there's an ulterior motive here, isn't there? 18, and David said unto Saul, Who am I, and what is my life, or my father's family in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? 19, but it came to pass at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given unto Adriel, the Hemolathite, to wife. 20, and Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David, his other daughter now. She loved David. Remember, the Bible says that David was very attractive, doesn't it? He was fair to look upon. He was ruddy in color. Do we know what ruddy means? Like a clayish tan. Yes, brother. A clayish. And we all know from California, adobe. They made the missions out of adobe brick. Clayish in color, reddish. He was a beautiful man. But it came to pass at the time when Merob, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David. I'm repeating that she was given unto Adriel, the Meholathite, to wife. 20. And Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. Why did it please him? 21. 
And Saul said, I will give him her, that she may be of what? Snare to him. Hmm. And that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law and the one of the twain. Sounds like, sounds like Saul might have read the book, The, the Adventist Home. Because he knows that everything starts in the house. Everything starts in the home. With the family. 22. And Saul commanded his servants, saying, Commune with David. How? Secretly. Lesson there. And say, Behold, the king hath delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now, therefore, be the king's son-in-law. So there's a very, very important, important aspect of this communing thing, isn't it? Commune with David secretly. Now, that's biblical, but it's not holy. Remember, Satan takes everything God has done and creates a counterfeit. He twists it upside down. Everything. Please keep that in mind. Let's go to 1 Kings now. Go forward a little bit to 1 Kings chapter 10. Let's look at the proper and correct way and God's way of communing. God's plan for communing. 1 Kings chapter 10. And we're moving along very well with time. Very well. Praise God. 1 Kings 10. <clears throat> we're all familiar with the story. All familiar. 1 Kings chapter 10. We're going to start at verse 1. Are we all there? Amen. 1 Kings 10, again, the Bible says, Lord, please continue to bless your words. Teach us today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with what kind of questions? Hard, hard questions. 2, verse 2. 1 Kings 10, verse 2. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she did what? Commune with him, how much? Of all that was in her heart. That's the definition of communing. You commune, you commune in secret between you and the other party and also you share everything. That's what communing is, right? My wife and I commune and share. There's nothing she doesn't know about me and vice versa. We commune. We've been communing for 25 years. Amen. 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 Three, and Solomon told her how much? All her questions. There was not anything hid from the king which he told her not. They commune. They shared everything. We're going somewhere with this. We're going somewhere. Let's go back to Exodus now. Exodus 25. Second book in the Bible. Exodus chapter 25. We're going to start at, at verse 1. Again, we're familiar with this, this passage. Exodus chapter 25. And when you all get there, please respond by saying amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Exodus 25. I still hear leaves. We there? Here we go. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, So who's talking to Moses? God is. Two. Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it how? Willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. Remember 2 Corinthians 9, 7, the Bible says that we should give with a what? A cheerful, or be a cheerful giver. Doesn't the Bible say that? Amen. So we're talking about the proof text method here with the Bible. Here a little, there a little. Amen. Three, and this is the offering which shall take of them, which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass. And he goes on down the list through verses four, five, six, and seven. Verse eight. This is one of the cornerstone verses of our faith, of our denomination. Exodus 25, eight. And let them make me a what? Sanctuary. Sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God with us. God with us. Nine, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. So he gave Brother Moses an example, a type, a figure, a shadow of what he wanted him to build. So apparently if God showed him this example of this type, figure, shadow, or model, or model representation, it had to be the perfect example. Amen? Amen. 
perfect. Skip up to verse 21 now. 21. Exodus 25 and 21. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, above upon the ark, excuse me, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. 22. This is our key verse. 22. And there I will meet with thee, and I will do what? Commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of how many things? Of all things which I will give thee in commandment to the children of God. Some of you have heard me say this before. When I first read this verse, it gave me an entirely different appreciation and respect for God. I read this and I said, God is coming to him. I want to meet you at this certain place and I want to commune with you. That's the kind of God we serve. He wants to talk to us. He wants to spend time with us. He wants to meet us in a certain place, a quiet place preferably, to talk to us. So God is making the first move, brothers and sisters, the first move in the communing process. Can somebody in this church say amen? amen. It is a beautiful, beautiful revelation. Beautiful. So God says, I love you, Moses. You're my son. I've chosen you. But we need to have a very, very tight relationship. Like white on rice. Like brown on rice. Amen. I'm not trying to be funny, but like brown on rice. Always think in health. Think in health. Amen. So this is key. Let's go to Exodus 33 now. Just skip forward eight chapters. Exodus 33. So we, we need to understand, brothers and sisters. Now, we won't understand completely 100% through and through, but we need to get a better, un, better understanding of our Father and what kind of relationship he wants with us. He wants a no-holds-barred, one-on-one, genuine relationship, intimate relationship with us. Amen. We're going to see that. Exodus 33, verse 7. We there? Amen. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp or outside the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord, are you seeking the Lord today? Everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Eight. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. They loved Moses. They cared for Moses. You know, in Exodus 34, actually the very next chapter, when he died, the Bible says that the children of Israel mourned for 30 days. They loved that brother. Nine. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord did what? Talk with Moses. Talk. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That's Deuteronomy 34. It talks about the death of Moses. Deuteronomy 34. Excuse me. So the Lord talked with Moses. Again, not Moses talked with the Lord. What does it say? What does the text say? The Lord talked with Moses. Let's see how he talked with him. 10. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshiped every man in his tent door. 11. Key verse. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his what? Mm. And he turned again into the camp, into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle as a friend. God wants friends. He wants to be our friend. Do you want to be his friend? I want to be his friend. His best friend. This is very, very important to understand. In John 15, 14, the Bible says, Ye are my friends. Jesus said this. Ye are my friends if you do what? Keep my commandments. Jesus wants to be our friend, brothers and sisters. It doesn't get any better than that. No better. If ye do whatsoever I command you, I will be your friend. Mm. Let's read something. Practical steps for an effective prayer life. I need this. Do you need this? In Psalm 55, 17. 
David says, morning, evening, and noon do I pray. Morning, evening, and noon. Three times a day. How many times? Three, Three times a day. Then he says in that same verse after that, he says, I will cry aloud. Do you ever do that? Then he says, here's the blessing. He says, after he says, morning, evening, and noon do I pray. Then he says, I will cry aloud. Then he says, and he will hear me. That's the blessing. So we're not crying off, beating our words off into the air. We have a Savior who hears everything we say. Amen. Every single word we say. He knows it before we say it. He knows our thoughts before we think them. He knew our thoughts before the foundations of the world were laid. But, but, he wants to hear us say it. How many parents do we have in, in this room, in this sanctuary? Okay, about everybody, except the young people. Don't you love when your kids come and talk to you? Our youngest is 28. We love when he comes and calls to talk to us. He's grown. So what? Just we want to hear your voice. It's important. We want a relationship. We want to maintain a relationship. It's the same thing God wants. Our father very much has emotions. Very human-like. Wouldn't you say that? It's beautiful. Psalm 119, 164, same chapter. He says, seven times a day do I praise thee. David says that, seven times. Can we ever praise God or pray to God or talk to God too much? It's impossible. He'll never get tired of us talking to him, ever. We have a friend in ministry. She lives out in, in uh, Idaho, Washington State, excuse me. And she has a voice machine, a voice message, a greeting on her voicemail. And she says, she says, I'm not available right now. Do you know you'll never hear those words from Jesus? It's perfect. I love that greeting. It says it all. It says it all. So he says in Psalm 55, 17, morning, evening, and noon, three times. And in Psalm 119, 164, how many times? Seven times. Seven times. But even that's not enough. I'm sure Brother David prayed more. I'm sure he prayed more. Let's read. This is from a book called A Call to Stand Apart, chapter 39, chapter 7, excuse me, page 39, chapter 7, page 39. When I first read this, it struck me. God is constantly speaking to us through nature, through scripture, and through his many providential interactions. Then she says, but that is not enough to keep us in a close relationship with him. And I said, wait a minute, and I didn't get to the next sentence yet. He speaks to us through nature clearly, as, as Elder Starks brought out so eloquently in Sabbath school, he wants us in the country. Why? Because he can communicate with us more clearly without disruption or without distraction. It's very simple. That's why Brother B uh, Billy taught us this morning, that's why he had Abraham leave, leave Haran. His dad took them out of Ur of the Chaldees first to Haran, and then he called Abraham, I need you to leave this place. That's the city. There's too many distractions there. I need you in Canaan, where we can commune more privately. So I said, okay, through nature, through scripture, obviously God talks to us through the word, obviously. The Bible says that he is the word, right? John 1, verses 1 through 3. And through his many providential interactions, seeing how God is leading you through your life and interceding for you in your life. But then she says something that blew my mind. You want to read it? She says, we also need to talk to him. We need to talk to God. That's what he wants. Prayer is opening our hearts to God just as we do with a what? A friend. There's that word again, friend. Prayer doesn't bring God down to us, no, brothers and sisters. It lifts us up to him. We can have, you and I can have, a most holy place experience right now. Because he wants us there by faith. Not bodily, but by faith. By faith. So when we're praying, remember now also, we can't bring everything in the most holy place with us. Some things that were allowed in the outer court weren't allowed in the, most, in the holy place, the first apartment. And there are things in the first apartment, the holy place, that cannot enter 
the most holy place. Maybe that's another study for another day. But the point is, we can be in that, third, that second apartment, the most holy place, by faith. Prayer lifts us up to him. Up to him. Oh, that's powerful. Very, very, very powerful. Very powerful. I'm going to read something to you from the Desire of Ages. This is very important. We're tying it all in. Desire of Ages 324, if you're taking notes. The Desire of Ages, page 324, paragraph 1. Please listen carefully. She says, when the soul surrenders itself to Christ, that's the first step, is it? A new power takes possession of the new heart. A change, is that an important word? A change is wrought which man can never accomplish for himself. Never. It is a supernatural work bringing a supernatural element into human nature. The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes his own fortress, which he holds in a revolted world, and he intends that no authority shall be known in it but his own. Jesus is jealous of us. Did you get that? Listen. A soul thus kept in possession by the heavenly agencies is impregnable to the assaults of Satan. The devil can't touch us. Do you want that? I want that. Amen. I want that. Please listen. Impregnable. But unless we do yield ourselves to the control of Christ, we shall be dominated by the wicked one. We must inevitably be under the control of the one or the other of the two great powers that are contending for the supremacy of the world. Just two. It is not necessary, please get this point, brothers and sisters. She says, it is not necessary for us to deliberately choose the service of the kingdom of darkness in order to come under its dominion. So you don't have to go out and cut your finger and then have to share blood with somebody and give your life to the devil and sacrifice your kids. No. Well, how does that happen? She says, we have only to neglect, that's a big word, to neglect to ally ourselves with the kingdom of light. If we do not cooperate with the heavenly agencies, brothers and sisters, Satan will take possession of the heart and will make it his abiding place. They can't share your heart together. God and the devil never work in harmony with each other. They're always at cross purposes. 24-7, 365. The only defense against evil is the indwelling of Christ in the heart through faith in his righteousness. Not our own, in his. We don't have any righteousness. Our righteousness, the Bible says, is what? Filthy? Amen. Amen. Unless we become vitally connected with God, vitally, we can never resist the unhallowed effects of self-love, self-indulgence, and temptation to sin. Those are the big three, the three missiles. Self-love, self-indulgence, and temptation to sin. We may leave off many bad habits for the time or temporarily, temporarily, we may part company with Satan. But, she says, but without a vital connection with God, through the surrender of ourselves to him moment by moment, we shall be overcome. Moment by moment. Is that once every couple of weeks? Brothers and sisters, this is real. This is the real deal right here. Without a personal acquaintance with Christ and a continual communion, a continual what church? Communion. communion. We are at the mercy of the enemy and shall do his bidding in the end. A continual communion. We have to be talking to God all the time. All the time. Communicating with him. Communing with him. Sister White brings that up. We can be on the bus stop, on the subway, at work, in the middle of a, of a field, somewhere. It doesn't matter where we are. Just talk. He says, talk to me. We have to talk to him. That's what he wants. He wants a relationship. 
I mentioned Miss P during my testimony last month. Some of you remember that? The five foot nine inch tall Jamaican, 80 year old Jamaican sister that trained me and my wife in this message back in 1996, 97, 98. Something happened that, that blew, again, blew my mind when we were early in this message. This had to be around maybe the year 2000. We baptized in 98, my wife and I, on two different dates. And Miss P now was about to move back to Jamaica. She was getting you know, advanced in years. At this point now, she's 82, 83, more or less, maybe even 84. <clears throat> and she, we were helping her get all her articles together, packing up stuff, moving furniture at her house in LA. And I was standing there doing something and she was within my view. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, she clapped her hands together like that. She was a very aggressive sister. Clapped her hands together, and this, remember, 80, 83, 84 years old, five foot nine inches tall, strong as an ox. She turned to the right, and she ran through the hallway into her living room. And I watched her through, through the glass door. I watched what she was doing. She ran into the living room, and she literally slid like, a, like somebody trying to steal second base in a baseball game. She slid on her knees to the couch and put her hands together and started praying because she realized it was after 12 noon. And that was her prayer time, morning, evening, and noon. And I said, remember now, I'm a, I'm a baby at Venice now. I'm, I, I stand there watching this. I'm like, this sister is serious about prayer. She slid to the couch. But brothers and sisters, that's what it takes. It takes dedication, consecration. It takes commitment. It takes commitment. It has to be the most important thing in our lives. If we're visiting family members who aren't Christians, who may not be necessarily at Venice, we don't compromise. Excuse me, I know we're all having a nice time. I have to go pray. Would you like to pray with me? That's how Miss P, that's the example she showed my wife and I. I don't care what's going on, I'm going to pray because God is my king and I'm gonna act like he's my king by keeping in contact with him by talking to him, by praying to him, and communicating to him as a what? As a friend. As a friend. Wonderful. I'm going to wrap up with this. When I was in college, I think I might have shared this at this church. I don't remember, but if not, I'll repeat it. When I was in college, I remember reading a, a comic strip. Some of us remember newspapers, amen. And some of us remember comic strips, amen. There was a comic strip that had a very profound effect on me. The fact that I'm even discussing it proves that. There was a comic strip that was a picture of a man and a woman getting married. They were at the altar, and the minister was there, you know, doing the vows, and they're both standing there in this comic strip. And there was a caption. You know how in the cartoons they have a caption over somebody's head? If there's a, an arrow or a line, like a point, it's, they're talking. If it's clouds, little puffy clouds, they're thinking. We all know that. So there was a cloud above the husband's head indicating what he was thinking. And there were little pictures, images inside that cloud of what was on his mind while he's getting married. So there was an image of him working on his car, under his car, in the garage. There was an image of him at the bar hanging out drinking with his friends. There was an image of him playing football with his friends. All these different images were just him. Then the wife now, over her head, there was a cloud over her head with the puffy clouds coming to her head, telling us, indicating what she was thinking, right? Oh, I forgot one other one. He also had, a, there was an image there of his wife serving him breakfast in bed, dressed very provocatively. Again, this was his image or indicate or how he thought or felt about marriage. So the wife has a cloud over her head. Her and her husband are walking on the beach holding hands. They're sitting at dinner, eating dinner together. They're reading a book or a magazine on the couch together. Everything they did was together. They had two different outlooks about marriage, didn't they? Let me ask you a question, Tullahoma Church. Which individual in this marriage had the closest outlook 
or point of view about marriage to how Jesus sees our relationship, the man or the woman. Clearly. Clearly the bride. The bride. Interesting, the bride. That's biblical too, but that's another, again, another study for another day. The point is, that's what God wants. He wants us to be with him all the time. God with us. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and she shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which interpreted is, or being interpreted is, God with us. Matthew 1.23, God with us. He really wants to be with us. Question is, do you want to be with him? I know I need to be with him. That picture I showed you in the opening, that's me. Often, that's me. Can anybody attest or agree with that? Yeah. That's me. We're talking about communion. We're talking about crying out to God. We all have weaknesses. We all have problems. We all have issues. Why? Because we're in a war. And the war is real. Satan is playing for keeps. He wants to win. He's not going to stop fighting and stop kicking and screaming until he's in the lake of fire, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Until he's in that lake. Up until that point, he's going to continue to fight against you and me. So my appeal is very simple and very brief. If you need prayer, I need prayer. And I've said it before, I'll say it again. I will pray up here by myself. But if anybody is struggling with anything, if anybody here needs more of a revelation of Christ in their lives, if they need a closer, you need a closer walking relationship, a real walking relationship with Jesus. Not praying once every other day. When I feel like praying, I'm too tired. I have to eat first. I got to feed the kids first. No, God comes first means God comes first. He has to come first in our lives. And everybody within the sound of my voice right here is going through something. How do I know that? Because we're human beings. We're sinners and we're human beings. But at some point in the future, this will all be done away with. We will be in heaven. I pray as neighbors. Amen? Anyone needing, needing prayer, I'm asking you, please come up. Let's pray together. Let's show God that we're a united front and we're all praying together in his house. Amen? Amen. Please be, feel free to join me. Amen. 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 Amen, church. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful and grateful again that you died in our place. You died a horrific life, a death. Mark 15 tells us that you hung on that tree from the third to the ninth hour, six hours, six dreadful, agonizing hours. The great propitiation you substituted for us, a death that we deserve, that you, of course, did not deserve, but you loved us, Lord. You still love us today. Lord, please help us. Everyone here is struggling with something. An unknown sin, a secret sin, health, or we know someone in our families or neighbors who are unhealthy, who are sick. Not just sin sick, but physically sick. Lord, you are the great healer. The Bible says, and I love these two words, a great multitudes, great multitudes followed you, thousands of people everywhere, because you gave hope. You healed, but you healed not for the sake of feeling better. You healed to make whole, spiritually whole, mind, body, and soul. Please bless those, Lord, who are in need of healing. Please help those, Lord, who are in need of a risen Savior, who have family members, children, grandchildren, who are outside of the ark of safety. We need them all in that ark, Lord, before you come. Just like you shut the door, the Bible says, on the ark, when Noah and his family were safe inside, our prayer, Lord, is that while the door is open, while the door of opportunity, while the door of probation is still open, that you will save our families. We heard a testimony a couple of months back. Brother Zach was preaching, and he talked about a man that prayed for somebody for 52 years, 52 years. And after this man passed away, his prayer was answered and this man gave his life to Christ. 
So we know by faith and promise, our prayers do not go off and drift off and disappear before they reach you. You hear every single one. Sister White says you write every single prayer in a book, never forgotten. Please help us hold to that promise, to keep that promise tucked in our hearts that we may one day, Lord, in the future, we pray in the near future, be side by side with you in the restored Eden, eating from the tree of life, drinking from the river of life that was created and restored for the healing of the nations. We love, we thank, and we ask you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you.